microbes are the most successful organisms on this planet. They have been able to live in environments that just decades ago we thought were uninhabitable. They can live in places of extreme pH, extreme temperature, or extreme salinity. How do they do this? Um, hi, I'm Kelly Dovitz, and in my presentation, I'm going to be introducing you to a community of microbes. And using their metabolites as clues, we are going to try to figure out how they make their living. So this summer, I got to work with Dr. Lauren Seiler. She's a microbiologist and she's been studying the microbes that live in the Coast Range Ophiolite. Now that is located in Northern California. It's about 30 miles east of Clear Lake and it is a microbial observatory called CROMO. Uh, this, this place, you might be wondering, so what's so special about it that it's been turned into a microbial observatory? Well, um, as an Ophiolite, what that means is it's a sheet of oceanic crust that has actually been uplifted on top of the continental crust, which um, is sort of rare. Usually um, oceanic crust, because it is denser, tends to be subducted underneath. But in this case, it's actually ended up on top. And also, the site is actively serpentinizing. And what that means is serpentinization is a process in which minerals like olivine, which are normally found in the oceanic crust, when they come into contact with water, they create serpentine. And the process also releases hydrogen, methane, and heat. Now, this process is of interest to scientists and to astrobiologists in particular, because when it, this happens on, at the sea floor, it creates hydrothermal vents. And these hydrothermal vents called white smokers release a chemical, uh, release a liquid, which is um, alkaline. And it's thought that this environment is where the origin of life may have happened on Earth. And if that hypothesis proves to be correct, then when we start to look for life elsewhere in the solar system, it would be very important to look for places where serpent serpentinization has taken place. So granted, looking at microbes down at the bottom of the ocean is quite tricky. So having a site like Chromo is much more helpful as these microbes are a lot closer to the surface. So, CSW, uh, so Chromo consists of 12 wells, and the well that we took data from was called CSW Old. And it's called Old because it's one of the original wells. It actually predates the observatory. And it's also the deepest well at 76.2 meters, though it's not the most alkaline. The most alkaline well has a pH of 12, and this one has a pH of between 9 and 10.5. There's very little oxygen. It's nutrient poor. And the groundwater there has not been in contact with the surface water. And we know that because the tritium, we did the tests showed that the tritium was below detection level. And tritium is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen. It's found in surface water. So if there had been a mixing of the two, you would have found it in the groundwater. So what this means is no new nutrients are being brought into this well. And so you have to wonder, how are the microbes surviving in this harsh environment? Well. In order to figure this out, we need to figure out how these microbes are getting their energy. And to do this, we can look at their metabolites. So what are metabolites? Well, metabolites are small compounds such as amino acids, lipids, or carbohydrates. They're produced by enzymes during metabolism and they're intermediates during a metabolic process. So for instance, this here is a metabolic process and py pyruvate right here is our metabolite. It's right in the middle there. And it, this process will turn glucose, sugar, into ethanol. And you might recognize this process. This is actually fermentation. This is how yeast um, create alcohol. And so if you can identify the metabolite in the process, you can figure out how these microbes are gaining their energy. So, but first, how are metabolites identified? Well, water samples were taken from CSW old and they were put through a process called liquid chromatography. And liquid chr chromatography, what it basically does is it separates the compounds in the water sample. So it's not unlike something you might have done in school. Um, this is called paper chromatography. It's what you do to separate colors. And essentially you just put an, a dot of ink, of colored ink onto the paper, and then you dip the paper in the water. And as the water rises, 
of the of the paper and touches the color, the colors begin to separate and they rise up the paper towel at different rates. So you can see here you've got yellow and then there's green and then finally there's blue. Um, so yeah, that's really similar to what's happening with our compounds. They're going through a solution um, called stationary phase and they're going through it at all different rates of speed. And the rate of speed in which they travel through the solution is called the retention time or RT for short. So you're able to assign a numeric value to that compound. Um, the next thing you do is you use mass spectrometry. And that would be using a mass spectrometer and you take your sample and you put it into the, into the machine and there's a heater there that vaporizes the sample and it ends up ionizing the particles. And as it travels through the magnet, it ends up getting separated based on its mass to charge ratio. So M over Z, where M is the molecular weight of the ion and Z is the number of charges present. So once again, you've ended up with a numeric value and what you can do with both the retention time and the mass to charge ratio number is look them up in a database and you can see which compound has both the same retention time and mass to charge ratio. So it sounds pretty simple, like you think like, okay, I'll just look this up on a database and there it'll be. But there are some challenges with identifying metabolites. Um, for instance, um, sometimes more than one compound was identified. So we used a database called Mummy Chug, and sometimes Mummy Chug would end up giving us two, three, or four compounds to choose from, and it would give us a best guess. Um, and also sometimes the compounds identified didn't really make sense. So sometimes you would have compounds that have more to do with human metabolisms. Um, you'd see things that metabolize drugs such as alcohol or caffeine, and it's not really what you would expect in a water sample of microbes. So these kind of strange findings, um, they could be due to two reasons. It could be due to contamination in the water sample, or it could be to, due to misidentification. And in that case, if, there, if a compound was misidentified, we could always take it, um, compare it to another database um, called ChemSpider and see what it had for, for the same retention time and mass to charge ratio. And if, if it turned out that there were just compounds that didn't make sense um, due to contamination or misidentification, we just discarded them from the data set. So not only is it important to be able to identify the compounds, it's also important to see how abundant these compounds are in the samples. So this, this chart here that you see, um, this is actually just a snapshot of a much larger spreadsheet. And each column, I'm sorry, each row is a compound and each column is a water sample. And I've colorized it so that the greater the abundancy, the darker the blue. And so, we, and, and the lighter, the, the less abundant. And so you're really wanting to find where these compounds are more abundant in the water samples. Ideally, you'd like to see a, a, like a long row of dark blue. Um, we didn't really find that. We found, we found shades of blue. Um, going throughout, um, but we picked out the ones that were the darkest and we went to see which compound was more highly represented. And so by doing that, we found out some interesting things about these microbes. For instance, the compound that was um, had the biggest abundancy was L-glutamic acid 5-phosphate. And you'll see this number here that's next to it. This number is what you use to look up this compound in another database called KEG and KEG will give you its metabolic pathway. Each compound has at least one metabolic pathway. And this one is associated with arginine and proline. And proline's kind of interesting because it has to do with protecting, uh, protecting against oxidative stress. And oxidative stress can happen in the environment. Um, it can be due to like extreme temperatures, but it can also be due to if, uh, if there just aren't enough nutrients for the organism. Um, and we do know since CSW old doesn't have a lot of nutrients, this might be a technique that the microbes are using to survive in this environment. Um, another compound that had high abundancy was, S, was S-formal glutathione. And that one uses the pathway of methane. And there's two types of organisms that use methane. You have methanotrophs, which consume methane, and you have methanogens that produce methane as a byproduct under anaerobic conditions, so conditions without oxygen. 
Now, with serpentinization, it does release methane. So that would be something that the methanotrophs could be using. Um, but for the methanogens, there are three different ways that you can make methane. One is to use CO2. Another is to use methanol. And then finally, you can use acetate. And serpentinization does release acetate. So that could be how, how these methanogens would be surviving in this well. And then finally, for another example of what we found, um, there was acetyl glutathione. And this uses the pyruvate pathway. And you might remember from earlier in my talk, I said that pyruvate has to do with fermentation. Now, earlier I mentioned that yeast use ethanol fermentation. Well, bacteria use lactic acid fermentation. And probably the most well-known example of that is when um, bacteria will break down the sugars in milk uh, to create cheese. So cheese is actually a bacterial byproduct, which sounds delicious. Um, so you can use the metabolome and the metabolites to find out more about the metabolic pathways in a community, but you can also use the metagenome. Um, so that would be the genes that were found in the water samples. And our project did do that. And in fact, my colleague, Cynthia, she will actually be speaking with you a little bit later today, and she will be talking about what she found in the metagenome. So in short, microbes are survivors. Their metabolisms allow them to live almost anywhere on Earth. Metabolites are the clues to understanding these metabolisms. And by studying places like CSW Old, we are learning how microbes make their living in these harsh environments. These methods can then be used in other places such as Mars or Europa or Enceladus, so that when life is discovered in these other places, we can find out how these alien microbes are making a living in their strange and wonderful worlds. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks to Dr. Lauren Seiler, my advisor, for um, all her wonderful guidance throughout the summer. And also to my colleague, Cynthia Valenzuela, for her collaboration and help as well. Um, thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions or some comments, I'd be happy to hear them. That was wonderful, Kelly. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so proud. Good job. All right. I think for, for questions, you can drop them in the chat or if you use the raise hand function, since there are a lot of us, it's helpful. I see Sanjoy has his hand up already, so we'll call on Sanjoy first. Thank you, Kelly. That's a really good presentation. Chromo oh, is close to my heart. Um, I was part of the team that drilled the wells 13 years ago. Oh my uh, gosh, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> um, my question has to do with the metabolites. So I think individually, each of these metabolites is not necessarily a signature of life. For example, amino acids, you can produce them in their interstellar medium, um, so they can be produced without life. But I'm wondering if the you, you were mentioning the abundance of the different metabolites, and if the ratio of the abundances between amino acids and the different other metabolites can be a signature of biology. So if you took like a scoop of water from the Enceladus ocean and you found amino acids in certain ratios with other types of metabolites could together they be, could be considered a biosignature? I'm, I'm, I'm not mm. sure. I, I think it's, I think if you find ones that are more likely within one pathway and you keep finding like a bunch of metabolites that have to do with a certain pathway in high abundancy, I think that would be a good indication. But like you said, yeah, certainly not always do compounds suggest that it's biological in nature. Um, yeah, that, that's really fascinating. Um, I think you'd also have to look for other things as well, just like genes um, to go along with the compounds. So you just need something that can help verify that what you're looking at is from a biological source. 